I'm Ethan Allen, and you, you join me on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting from the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu in Pioneer Plaza. Glad you're here. Likeable Science is all about helping people realize that science is really basically fun. Science is great. Science should be a valued and vital and interesting part of everyone's life, and I'm here to preach that gospel, as it were. So I'm glad you joined me uh, today to help me talk about uh, science and why it's interesting and what's interesting about it. Uh, we have joining us via Skype a meteorologist from the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Sorry, NOAA, just to uh, keep the shorthand. Tom Del Delberto. Hi, Tom. Hi, Ethan. How are you? I'm doing well. Great to see you. Thanks for joining thanks. us here. Well, thanks for having me. Excellent. So uh, Tom is uh, uh, a federal contractor at the Climate Prediction Center, and he's also uh, part of a group called Innovim, I guess. I don't quite yeah. understand the relationship between Innovim and NOAA, but... Uh, sure, yeah. Innovim is... I'm a federal contractor, so technically I work for Innovim. They're the ones who uh, write the checks, so to speak, but I, uh, I work full-time at the Climate Prediction Center um, inside NOAA. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, excellent. And, and you're joining us from the East Coast there, from the D.C. area, so... Uh, He's stayed up a little, a little bit late here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not nearly as warm as it is in Hawaii, but we're getting there. That's just right, good to that's see. right. You'll catch up here in, in another month or two, right? That's, that's true. <laughs> so uh, Tom uh, knew he was going to be a me meteorologist, apparently from a very early age. He, uh, around first grade, got intrigued with snowstorms and hurricanes in Long Island and uh, decided then and there that, that this was what he wanted to spend his life doing. He went on to get a bachelor's degree in atmospheric science from Cornell. He took a master's at Stony Brook studying storm surges around uh, New York uh, metropolitan region. Uh, and he is, uh, as, as he said, currently with, with NOAA and the Climate Prediction Center. He forecasts uh, what are called ENSOs, which are the El Nino Southern Oscillation, I believe, if I got that acronym right. And he writes weather and climate content for the NOAA climate.gov site. So, and we're really going to talk today about sort of why, sort of what's special about meteorology in a sense, uh, some, some of the uncertainties that are involved in it, and, and what that, how that shapes the field, as it were. So I thought we might start out with just to help put some context on this uh, with a few basic definitions. So meteorology, you know, not study meteors, obviously. <laughs> no, hydrometeors. It's one of the, the classic... A lot of times people hear meteorology, they'll ask me about asteroids. And while I find asteroids fascinating, I really know little about them. Um, meteorology, it's basically the study of our atmosphere, right. um, specifically weather um, in general across, uh, across the globe. Right. Any, anything that's happening above the ground up to where space begins, really. And Pretty much. The, yeah, the entirety. Of the There's some interesting things that go on in, in all aspects of our atmosphere, even some of the places even as far up as you can go. Yeah, it's very, very uh, intriguing. Uh, patterns are different at different, different heights and all, I gather, and all, mm -hmm. all kinds of different uh, electrical phenomena going on. And, it's true, uh, yeah. yeah. And just, to, again, to clarify a couple other basic sort of concepts here, we, we often talk about weather and climate, and weather is more or less just short-term, day-to-day stuff that happens to us, rain, mm -hmm. sun, winds, whereas climate is sort of more the longer-term things you expect from month to month or year to year, right? Exactly, and I like to think of it as uh, weather is your mood and climate's your personality. Ah, very nice analogy. Very nice. So it's a, it's so sometimes the, your mood can change on any individual day, but if you generally know someone's personality, you assume that's what they're going to be like on that day. Yeah. Right, right. And so this gets into the, sort of the, the whole issue, and one of the, one of the fundamental things that un underlies the uncertainties is short-term versus long-term issues, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of weather predictions these days, in a lot of places at least, are remarkably good in the short term. You can, up to three, maybe four days out, give quite accurate, quite precise information about what, what's likely to happen in terms of the weather. But once you make that jump out to seven to ten days, those b begin to get a lot shakier, right? That's, that's very true. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing the leaps we've taken even since the 1970s. Um, the night, our, I believe our five-day weather forecast is as good as a two- to three-day forecast was in the 1970s. So we've made tremendous leaps in that, but still, uh, when you get out past seven, ten days-ish, 
uh, the skill that we have is basically not good. There's really no skill past that time frame. <laughs> It's all just luck, huh? It's all, so if someone's giving you a 17-day forecast, I really wouldn't put too much worth in the, in the anything past day 10. Right, and this is, this is all fundamentally it has to do with one of my sort of favorite topics, which is, is systems and interactions, right? Because mm -hmm. the climate and indeed the weather is basically caused by the sort of interactions among a whole bunch of very complex systems and subsystems that all interact with one another in... in very complicated ways, right? There are areas of high pressure, areas of low pressure, prevailing winds, uh, general temperatures, there's the way the jet stream is moving at, at the, the moment. There are major storms elsewhere on the planet that are, that are affecting things. Uh, and yeah, it's, it, that's exactly right. And the hard part about it is that it, the atmosphere is so complex and there's so many things going on and then we have to try and model it. Right. And we know that we just don't have observations everywhere. So we can't, what we put into our weather models is not right, right from the get-go. Because right. it's just taking like snippets of information across the globe. So then as a meteorologist, what you have to do is know that, well, the model's not going to be right to begin with, but I know it might be wrong here. And I know how the model likes to deal with this type of error here. And it's all just basically these educated educated kind of thoughts based on what we know is already wrong to begin with. <laughs> right. It, it, it would be some, somewhat like just looking at, say, a few dozen pixels off a television screen and trying to predict what, what was going to be the picture five minutes from now. Exactly. I mean, the good news is that we've, we've added a lot of pixels in the last 30, 40 years, but it's still nowhere near enough to uh, give us a, the best possible picture we could possibly have. Right. So, uh, yeah, it really, it really gets to be a, a very sophisticated modeling game these days, I guess. Uh, and, and I guess there are tons of mathematicians and all kinds of different modelers who, who spend their lives trying to figure out how, how best to plug these factors in in the right, the right relationships with one another to make, make everything play the games the way nature plays it. Exactly. And it's... It's difficult because a lot of the fanciest techniques for doing this require stronger, bigger, faster computers to run them, which costs lots of money. So then you run into the problem of playing a more of an economic game, saying, well, we only have this much money. What should we be focusing on to give us the best bang for our buck, so to speak? Uh, and it's, it's, it's difficult. And you're right. There are people who spend every day of their lives thinking about ways of better accurately modeling our planet. Yeah, I work a little bit on a climate education project here, and in doing some of the reading, I'm, I'm impressed that people will now look and they'll say, well, you know, we ran 17 different models of this scenario, and, and here, here are these 17 different trend lines, and, you know, you can pick and choose which ones you like, or we can, here's the average of these 17 models. And oftentimes they're quite different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. And it, there's multiple models that the, the government runs, weather models, for all sorts of situations. We have really high resolution models, which have a lot of grid points really close to each other, so you have a better understanding of maybe something like a severe weather outbreak across the, the mainland. Um, but that takes a lot of computer time, so we only run that out for maybe 24 to 48 hours. Then we have these global models that are run for the entire planet, and those run out a lot farther, out to day seven, day 10, um, even further than that. And it, it's one of those things, there's, there's so many, we run wave models, we run so many different things. Um, and basically now there's a, a glut of information for, for forecasters to look at. Right, and again, as with so many things, it's, it's which information you, you find, which, which you believe, and sort of how you weight that information. I exactly, it's, and if you ask a, a weather forecaster, it's. It's part-time science, and then there's also a little bit of kind of artistry with it, so to speak, because uh, because it's not all it's it's not all correct, and and you know that some models do better than other models, and some forecasters think some models do better than other models in certain situations. So um, each model, each forecaster has their own sort of technique of what to do with all of this slightly incomplete information. Right. So th there was a good example of that earlier this year out here in the Pacific. Uh, there was an anomaly in the uh, deep 
eastern Pacific Ocean with a, a bolus, as it were, a big spot of warm, unusually warm water, fairly deep, quite far at the, at the eastern edge of the Pacific, gradually moving west. And it was large enough and hot enough that after looking at it a little bit, a number of the, the modelers began saying, oh, there's going to be a very severe El Nino this year. And, and they, they first started saying, well, there's a 50-50 probability of that. And then it became 75%. And I think for a while, they had it up to 85 or 90%. And then something happened. <laughs> and the predictions began getting shakier and down, downgrading. And the, whether the water dispersed or what, I'm not quite sure. But, but again, again the, it didn't play out quite as badly, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a very severe El Nino at all now. Well, it was it's certainly been a really interesting year. Um, at, I'm one of the forecasters for El Nino Southern Oscillation at the Climate Prediction Center, which is the government's official stance on uh, what we're expecting. But yeah, this last year was very odd, and it's one of those things as a meteorologist, you can never be overconfident in your understanding of Mother Nature because she'll <laughs> always throw something at you that you just did not expect to see. Exactly. And you're right, last year at this time there is a very strong pool of this warm water at depth, as you mentioned, moving uh, to the east. It was called a, a, a downwelling Kelvin wave. And it was one of the strongest that we had seen in several years. And usually what that happens is that will help kickstart El Nino. But what happened was that the, 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 the water made its way over to the east and then the atmosphere acted like nothing happened. So with El Nino, you need to have these two things kind of working together, the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, but it was like the ocean was knocking at the front door, and the atmosphere was refusing to answer the door. Uh, <laughs> so it, and it, and it went on for a very long time. And it just kind of went against a lot of what we normally expect to see during an El Nino. Right. Um, or expect to see, So which is why the probabilities got so high, because in history and, and what the models were saying, they were all saying this is going to be an El Nino, um, and past experience said so, and it just, it just didn't click um, this time. But um, as of last month, we're officially in a weak El Nino, and we currently have another downwelling Kelvin wave of that warm area of warm water moving on east, and uh, the thinking is maybe this time <laughs> this one will kick it into uh, a little bit more of a classic El Nino type uh, situation. Interesting, and it may be just a lack of data uh, in the past. Historically, you, you couldn't see these things well enough, often enough, accurately enough, and, and now it may turn out that, yeah, you need them several times running to really kick the, the, the weather pattern in, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. and it, even just the history of El Nino, El Nino itself wasn't really discovered in a sense until you could actually have things monitoring the Pacific Ocean. So it really was a 19th century, even the middle of the 19th century, where they finally were able to see um, what was going on in the Pacific, which is funny to think about now because we know that ENSO controls so many things across the entire globe. And it affects so many different aspects of weather, not only in the tropics and the Pacific, but everywhere across the globe. So, um, and as you said, once we had more observations in the Pacific, um, it gave us a better idea of, uh, of what was actually going on. But even that said, there's still uh, a large data gap over, over the Pacific Ocean that we could also always do, uh, do better with. Sure. Well, the Pacific's a very, very, very big place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very lot, a lot of water yeah, in the Pacific yeah. Ocean. Uh, but now we actually do have uh, so-called proxies, right, for the, for the El Nino. Historically, there are, there are geological markers, as it were, that, that suggest at least when, when El Ninos have occurred in the past and when La Nina conditions prevailed. Yeah. It's exactly right. They, you could take coral uh, samples. The corals have been around for a long time. You can take samples of them. You get ideas of rainfall patterns and, and proxies for sea surface temperature. So yeah, um, research has extended back at least in general what ENSO and El Nino sun oscillation was like going back thousands and thousands of years. And um, it's been tied to some certainly interesting things, including um, ancient civilizations disappearing could be tied to drought related to long periods of El Nino. So um, it, it just basically reflected kind of what we already know now is the power of, uh, of El Ninos and La Ninas. A absolutely. This is, a, uh, this is uh, how this uh, plays out in, in very meaningful ways. Uh, as you say, that there's some indications yeah, that, that uh, society's futures are shaped in a lot of ways by, by this phenomenon. 
And we're going to get into talking, I think, a little more detail maybe about what we've tossed around this term El Nino and La Nina. And uh, in our next segment, we're going to look a little bit more at the modeling of this and, and why, you know, what, what we really mean by this and why this happens. But I think we're going to probably have to take a little break at this point first. And uh, then we'll come back and do that. So uh, you, you've been here on Likeable Science with me, Ethan Allen. And Tom Dillabro from NOAA has been joining me. And we're talking about meteorology, inherent uncertainties. We'll be right back. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. Okay. We call it Energy Wednesday so every Wednesday. We're going to Are you surprised? Them. Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starley from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum sure. to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us, 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today via Skype is meteorologist Tom Diliberto from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And we're talking about meteorology and weather, climate, and all, all the uncertainties that are inherent in that. And we last, in our first segment, started talking about uh, El Nino and La Nina, which are terms that get tossed around a good deal. But I thought it might be good to sort of show a couple images about sort of what these really mean. And so uh, there's a, some models or some, I guess they're really pictures of models, I guess, that show uh, sort of the, the well, why don't, why don't you sort of explain these? Uh, here's one of sort of neutral conditions, and it's looking across a good section of the Pacific Ocean. Sure. These are basically schematics, as we like to call it, of a the idealized sort of situation that goes on in the Pacific Ocean. So um, what controls a lot of the weather along the equator in the Pacific Ocean is something called the Walker Circulation. And during normal times when there's no El Nino and there's no La Nina, just called neutral conditions, this image is basically what the pattern looks like, um, specifically for the winter time. Um, and base, it, and the, the key points to take out is that the generalized weather patterns along this, this giant circulation in the Pacific Ocean. And what you do find is that over the maritime continent, when you get to, to Papua New Guinea, um, the Philippines, even again in Australia, you generally see convection. You see thunderstorms, you see rising air. Right. Um, which is why you see that really big arrow in the, in the tall clouds there. Um, and then subsequently, when air rises, it basically can't rise forever. So right. eventually it reaches the top of what's the, the troposphere, which is the lowest part of the atmosphere, and it basically fans out. And then on either side of that, you have downward branches of the Walker circulation, which, you, which happens across the eastern uh, Pacific Ocean. And then you also have a couple of other branches, one uh, a weaker upward branch over Africa, and then another one over uh, northern parts of South America. 
And that's the generalized pattern that you would normally see in the Pacific Ocean. Right. So then, un under an El Nino condition, I think that, that those arrows we'll see in this next diagram change a bit in terms of their, their relationship to all. So here we are at El Nino, and the positions of the, the, the arrows have sort of shifted, right? That's exactly right. Basically, what we see with El Nino is that the, where the, there's this warm pool of water that basically moves off to the east around the date line, getting to around 150, or even can go across the entirety of the, the Pacific all the way to, to South America. And what that does is basically that convection. Those thunderstorms move with the warm water. So as opposed to having that upward branch over Indonesia, over the Philippines, over that region, it now shifts closer to the date line, or maybe just east of the date line between 180 and 150 degrees west. Um, and that could have substantial, substantial issues for um, areas that normally expect to see that upward branch of rainfall. Um, and that could lead to widespread drought. Why one of the classic signals, one of the classic results of a strong El Nino is that you see drought across a large portion of the Pacific Ocean. And it's because basically this walker circulation gets jumbled around and then shifted off, uh, shifted off to the east. Right, exactly. And yes, as you can see, it's going to alter where the rain falls, where storms happen, and, and all this. And then the third sort of alternate is, is shown in the third diagram, the, the so-called La Nina, which is sort of truly the, op the opposite, right, of, uh, of an El Nino. That's exactly, as exactly right. As opposed to a warming of the equatorial, central and eastern equatorial Pacific, you see a cooling of the central and equatorial Pacific. And this is, ba La Nina conditions is basically like taking the neutral conditions and then turning it on overdrive. Mm -hmm. So you see even stronger convection over the maritime continent. You see even stronger sinking air over the Pacific Ocean. You see basically, uh, you then would see, expect to see flooding conditions. A lot of rainfall during their monsoon across the maritime continent. You'd see even heavier rainfall across north and, uh, northern parts of South America. But you would then see less rainfall in the eastern Pacific, which could have uh, major impacts for Central America. Um, which really impacts um, the, the hurricane season in the eastern Pacific Ocean. Um, so you get, it's, a, it's a large amount of impacts that they can basically change between whether it's cooling on the uh, equatorial Pacific or if it's warming. Right, and the, the underlying factors that drive this are sort of the, the position of heat, hot water within the Pacific, right? I mean, it's sort of a, at least one of the key things, right? Sure, exactly. What's happening across the Pacific Ocean, as I'm sure everyone knows in Hawaii, there are the trade winds. The trade winds basically blow uh, east to west, and what it does is it helps actually pile up water on the western side of the Pacific Ocean. The, the ocean level on the Pacific Ocean and the western side is actually higher than the eastern side because the winds are always pushing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, what usually starts off in El Nino, or at least is associated with El Nino uh, in El Nino, is that those trade winds weaken or even reverse themselves. And that basically allows that water to slosh on back, uh, back to the east um, with, uh, with large consequences. And basically what it does is, again, it's, it changes the gradients of sea surface temperatures, how they change over different areas, and you basically then see that convection shift right. um, uh, across those areas. Okay. Yeah, and, and so this is, yeah, this is interesting that, that we see this level of shifting, and yet... And maybe I'm being, I'm being only slightly facetious here. It, it seems to me, in a place like Hawaii, it would be relatively easy that as I can sit here and say, hey, next, you know, next year at this time, it's going to be about this same temperature. And I, I give you pretty good odds on that on, on any given day here in April. It's going to be, you know, hey, our high is going to be in the <laughs> mid-80s. Our low is going to be in the, you know, low to mid-70s. And that's, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I could bet a lot of money on that. But... <laughs> Compared to a place like, say, Kansas or Texas or somewhere, you can't, you can't make any kind of prediction like that, right? I mean, the, the variation is just much, much bigger. Exactly right. It's because how Hawaii is situated basically in the, you're, you're around the tropics. And right. what happens is there is that the temperature difference, there really aren't temperature differences. There's, you don't really get a classic cold front like you would get in Kansas. Right. And because you don't have those temperature changes, you basically have a different way. It's really different the way it rains, so to speak, in the tropics as, a, as opposed to where you have in the mid-latitudes. In the mid-latitudes, uh, across the mainland United States, 
um, weather is driven by temperature differences. You have cold air in the north, and you have warm air in the south, and they happen to meet in the mid-latitudes, and they would happen to meet across the mainland United States, and that basically allows these storm systems to grow. Meanwhile, here in the, in the, in the tropics, in, in, in Hawaii, it's a little bit different. So this is why you can generally assume that it's going to be the same temperature, um, uh, high and a low, around the same idea, and then also probably you're going to get some showers when the winds go up against the mountains uh, as well. It's, it's, it's much more predictable in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we know, at least with ENSO, with El Nino, you can see big differences in tropical storms. You could see, uh, I know last year we had a couple of storms impact the Hawaiian island chain. Mm -hmm. um, and you tend to see these things happen occur more often during um, El Nino events because you tend to see more hurricanes in um, the eastern uh, part of the Pacific Ocean, um, as opposed to La Nina, where you tend to see less. Mm -hmm. So uh, in some sense, you can get some idea on some type of weather patterns that would be more often or, or less often for, for the tropics, um, uh, just basically due to El Nino. Right. I think our f next image, our fourth image in, in a series, may, may speak a little bit to that. Um, to, to the whole business of the uncertainty that, that, that uh, plays out. But maybe we're not going to get our fourth image. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I should yeah. know one other thing. So the interesting thing is that these images that you're showing, um, this last year, what was strange was that we didn't see this shift in the walker circulation. Mm -hmm. We saw the shift in the ocean temperatures for El Nino, but the walker circulation didn't shift. Right. There was no increased thunderstorm activity around the dateline for a very large portion of the summer and getting into the, the fall of last year. Um, and that's what's kind of shifted recently um, to basically we've seen an increase in the amount of convection around the dateline, which is more of a classical type of situation where you normally see with an El Nino. But that was what was so confounding with this last year was that the oceans kind of did its job, but the <laughs> atmosphere didn't so much do its job. Just, just can't count on Mother Nature. Some, nope. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, th this, this fourth image that we brought up uh, is a sort of a different view of things here. Um, and uh, looking uh, more, more to the continent here, I guess. And is this the, uh, the, the three-month outlook? Right. I believe this is. This is with a, the, the heavily, heavy shading on the western uh, coast. Sure. And this is one big difference from what we were talking about earlier with forecasting weather short term versus longer term, which is just a three month outlook. Uh -huh. You'll note that we're not trying to tell you anywhere in the United States what the exact temperature is going to be three months from now. What we're basically saying here is we're giving a percentage chance of whether temperatures are going to be above average or below average. Uh -huh. And that's a big difference, which is why we can make these outlooks. Sure. Because it's a little bit, di climate outlooks are a little bit different than weather. We're not going to tell you it's going to be 74 degrees in Kansas in May. We're saying, well, it could be an equal chance of it being above average, below average, or around average. But you can see in the, in the forecast, this is for April, May, and June, mm -hmm. that the forecasts are expecting a, a pretty high chance of it being above average for the West Coast, um, which would be bad news because we've already experienced very warm temperatures on the West Coast. Um, and we've seen a tremendously uh, horrible drought across California. And this is just basically saying that those hot conditions are expected to continue, at least with a, probably a 55 to 60 percent chance of that. Um, and you can see that the exact opposite for parts of Texas. Um, so this really kind of hits home in terms of the difference between a weather forecast that you would get in the nightly news versus some of these longer term climate outlooks um, that we provide. Absolutely. And we're going to look at more of this kind of stuff here in our next segment, but we're going to have to take a little break right now. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science. Tom Diliberto is with us from NOAA in Washington, D.C. We're talking about meteorology and uncertainties inherent to it. We'll be right back. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. 
inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends when we're busy. We get together less often, but we'd love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about healthcare, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. And you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, broadcasting here from the ThinkTech studios. With me today, joining me via Skype, is Tom Giliberto from Washington, D.C., from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We're talking about uh, his passion of meteorology, you know, the, the science uh, around our atmosphere. And we've been talking about uh, uh, El Nino's and La Nina's and, and uh, hot water in the Pacific and all. But I thought we should take a look and sort of see what this really means and how this plays out. And there's a, uh, a video, a short little video clip of a very interesting thing that happened uh, uh, a month or so ago here, I guess, when we had two cyclones, two typhoons, two hurricanes, basically, spawned at more or less the same time in the North and South Hemisphere at pretty close to the same spot, sort of just on either side of the equator. Yeah, that's exactly right. They're, they're, it, this, this phenomenon is called the twin cyclogenesis. Huh. Um, and it forms because uh, what you get along the equator um, in the, uh, the, west, uh, the, yeah, the Western Pacific um, is occasionally you get these bursts of westerly winds. Now, usually the trade winds come from the east, but occasionally you get these westerly winds. And these are the kind of things that I mentioned earlier help set off El Nino. Um, but when you get these bursts of westerly winds, it's like dragging your finger through a pool. Um, and you kind of get these spirals on either end of it. Um, and that's what happened. We saw this basically this large area of thunderstorm activity, which was spanning the equator. You had this burst of westerly winds, and you saw two cyclones spin off at roughly the same time, at roughly the same longitude um, across the Pacific. Um, the one in the Southern Hemisphere was, became Cyclone Pam, and the one in the Northern Hemisphere became Tropical Storm Bavi. Uh, now, Tropical Storm Bavi didn't become that strong, um, but it did affect Guam uh, and some of the islands there um, uh, in the, the, the Northwestern Pacific. Um, but Cyclone Pam, um, if you remember, strengthened considerably, it became a Category 5 storm and took in Vanuatu, and, and it took possibly the worst possible track um, across the across Vanuatu, uh, basically putting uh, the islands in, in, in basically the, the worst portion of the storm and, and causing uh, massive devastation. Um, and these type of events, these twin cyclones, they may seem rare. They happen roughly once or twice a year to two years to three years to four years, but you do tend to see them more often either preceding or during El Nino events. Oh, okay. So these twin cyclones that you saw is, is one, p potentially one example of why we're thinking the atmosphere is kind of joining in with the ocean and kind of seeing that connection that we've been missing for the better part of 2014 and the beginning of 2015. I see, I see, okay. So these, these sorts of odd extreme events now do seem to be getting to some extent, more common, and a lot of people refer to the, the fact that, you know, the, the storm of the century is now becoming the storm of the decade or, or the storm of the last few years, uh, and then is superseded by some yet bigger, worse uh, storm or a lar longer, more severe drought. Uh, are we really seeing, uh, you know, major changes, do you think, in, in, in climate patterns in this sense? Uh, I would say we've certainly seen changes in certain types of extreme weather. Um, we've seen heat waves get hotter and longer, last longer. Um, we've seen cyc the idea being with cyclones is we don't exactly know what's going to happen to their number, whether the number is going to increase or decrease, but um, the general consensus is that cyclones, if they do form, are more, are more likely to get stronger. And we've already seen 
um, Cyclone Pam. March is relatively a calm month globally for, for cyclones, and we saw a lot of action in March. You had Cyclone Pam in the Southern Hemisphere became a Category 5 storm with 145 knot winds. And then we also then saw a a another super uh, typhoon, or so a strong uh, Category 4 or 5 storm in the northern Pacific Ocean, right after Tropical Storm Bavi happened. Right, so May 6th, it just devastated both Chuk and Yap. Chuk, Chuk and Yap, exactly. And this is an early time for those type of storms to form to that strength. Um, so it's it's one concern going forward, especially. It's one of the, the big area of research is what's going to happen in these major storms um, in the future. Are they going to become more frequent, as well as figuring out exactly um, uh, their, their strength. But um, one other thing to note is that generally when you, when we, with climate change, you're going to expect general, a generalized warming across the globe. Not everywhere is going to warm the exact same, but generalized warming. Um, warmer air holds more water a very simplistic way of thinking about it right and we've already seen um an increase in extreme rainfall events across the mainland united states mm -hmm. maybe not so much get, uh, uh, in hawaii um but we've already especially in the mainland where um it's not always humid <laughs> in, the, in hawaii it's a little bit more humid than there is um, in the united states uh, the mainland united states um but we've seen we've seen an increase in the heaviest rainfall events right a and that causes a whole other sort of issues in terms of infrastructure uh we build more roads uh we take less there's less soil out there to absorb water and when you have heavier rainfall events it leads to more flash flooding uh, which i'm sure is something that people in hawaii completely understand um i, re I remember the manoa floods back uh was it 2005 or 2004 mm -hmm. um that were just came right down the right down the campus um, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that can, you know, flash flooding can cause a tremendous amount of damage. Right. But at the same time, we're, we're in parts of the North, in parts of the U.S., such as the Northeast, we've been getting more rain than usual. In other parts, particularly the Southwest, we've been getting less than usual. There, California is now in, what, its fourth drought year in a row, basically, or something. Yeah, it's fourth drought year in a row, and back-to-back -back years with some of the w least rainfall on record. And right. uh, this last uh, January through March was the warmest on record, I believe, for California, um, breaking the record that was just set last year. Um, and there, that's a drought that's not going to be busted in one year. It's going to take a long time for them to get out of that. And right now, I know um, they rely on snowpack um, in the Sierra Nevada and it's yeah, Sierra Nevada mountains, and it's very, very low. Right. Snowpack is what five percent of the expected normal or something at this point. Uh, I mean, exactly. It's, it's and we're pretty much at the end of the rainy season. There's not much time once we get into May. It gets dry across a lot of California, so right. uh, a lot of areas that rely on the melt of that snowpack is really not going to be looking f uh, looking good uh, going forward, which is why there are now water restrictions across the state. Right, and, and it, yeah, go ahead. In places like uh, uh, the Salinas Valley, they're already they're pumping groundwater out so fast that the, the ground is actually settling at alarming rates there, a foot a year in some places, and. One can't help but suspect that that's, that's going to accelerate with this. this uh, sure. There's a, there's a lot of these impacts that you would normally not think about um, unless you got to an extreme situation. And this is really an extreme situation for the West Coast, especially for, for California. And a lot of the produce grown for the United States comes from the state of California. Right. Um, so it, there's a, a large potential impact uh, nationwide um, uh, with this drought going forward. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there are talk about you know another 1930s dust bowl kind of phenomena go, going on, and that's quite alarming if that happens, particularly if it happens in, in sort of the breadbasket of the U.S. as it were. Sure, sure. And then you know uh, we haven't had droughts necessarily as bad as this California one, but even going back three or four years, we've had bad droughts in Texas. We've had bad droughts in Oklahoma. Um, we've seen droughts across the northern parts of the plains. So. Um, the one interesting thing going forward, uh, especially with climate change, is seeing how these droughts shift. Naturally, there are droughts. Mm -hmm. They occur naturally. Right. Um, but the question is going to be, when you combine a drought with warmer temperatures, warmer temperatures basically help to exacerbate, to make the droughts worse. So it could be one thing where you could have a natural drought, but with warmer temperatures, it makes things dry out faster than you'd normally see it. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's we've seen that out here in the Pacific uh, last year, the, the northern part of the Marshall Islands, just they it just stopped raining there for a long, long time. And they simply ran out of water. And, and 
literally had to, on some of the atolls, just had to evacuate the people because there, there was no, simply was no more water there. They couldn't grow any crops. They couldn't grow any food. Uh, they, it, I mean, either had to bring in all the food and water for the people, or they had to get the people off the islands because that was wow. that was what, what they were stuck with. So, and the the hope is that with climate predictions, with monthly predictions, that we'd be able to forecast it. Right. But in those situations, usually what we look for is an El Nino signal. And if you can predict an El Nino with a lot of months in, in advance, that's really valuable information to places that normally see droughts during El Nino, because then they can prepare. They can get water situated, uh, at least getting ready to, so they can get water out to places that they know usually run out of water during, uh, during drought events. Exactly. That, that's why uh, I forwarded the prediction of the El Nino about this time last year to the sites for my Water for Life project. And we started by, uh, putting in these things called bob bags, these big flexible bags that can hold 350 gallons of water and uh, uh, pre prepared for a, 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 some severe drought. And it hasn't actually happened, but um, people are a little, little more ready for it now. And uh, of course, unfortunately, in, in both Chuuk and Yap, a lot of the, the they've just suffered from such a, a horrendous uh, cyclone typhoon there that uh, a lot of the, the whole infrastructure there is just, just gone. Um, that they have, have no roofs to catch rainwater on anymore. Most mm -hmm. places. Um, so, what's sort of what's the outlook going forward here? I mean, uh, you point out from the '70s till now, we, we've done a lot better on our. Uh, we've extended the uh, time for uh, uh, sort of the near-term forecast quite a bit, from two or three days up to four to five days. Do we see this continuing? Or in the next 15, 20 years, do you think we're going to be able to do very accurate seven to ten-day forecasts? Well, we hope so. I mean, seven to ten day, it, we, they do show skill. Um, so you can use a seven to ten day forecast. But there, the, the inherent problem with making really strong weather predictions is, uh, really accurate weather predictions, is that um, you're running up against chaos theory. Mm -hmm. This idea that when you have a little error in your model at day zero, it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger the longer you go out. And that's just something that it, it, it's much more difficult to actually deal with. There are techniques of ways of doing it, but the best way of dealing with that situation is making sure that the error at the very beginning is as little as possible. Um, so that's one aspect that you could see uh, going forward. Maybe we get more weather observations, not only at the ground, but throughout the atmosphere. Right. We get stronger computers to run better models on to kind of to kind of deal with these situations. But um, there is a natural limit to weather predictability on that specific scale that, that folks like to, like to see. Okay, well, excellent. This has been such fun talking with you, and, and I've learned a great deal from it. Uh, I now know a whole lot more about, about meteorology than I did before, and, and feel like I've, I've got a better handle on, on the weather and the climate. Uh, so that, that's great. Uh, I very much appreciate your being with us here uh, uh, remotely and taking time from your Friday evening to come join us here on Likeable Science. Thank you so much, Tom, and uh, aloha. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great talk. Okay, bye-bye. And aloha to all the viewers. We'll see you next week.